Well, good evening. Welcome to this meeting of Columbia Road Baptist Church. I am so glad you're here for our second night of our World Mission Conference. We had a great evening yesterday, and I hope that if you weren't able to be with us, you'll go back online. Uh, we, I was helped. I was helped. Brother Boyle brought the message in here, and Brother Sturtz was in with the young people, and they, they smuggled Bibles, from what I understand, in the other place. So that's, that's sort of a neat thing. And so we, we talked about whether we can do that in the adult Sunday school classes on uh, on Sunday, but we'll have, to, we'll have to see how that might work out. But we do have our missionary guests with us. We have uh, Brother Luke, made it in late last night. There he is. Brother, would you stand up for a second? Amen. Brother Paul Harrigan is with him as well. And so there's Brother Paul. The Boyles are with us, in case you haven't met them yet. Here's... And then, where's Pastor Jenkins? I see, there, there he is. He's already standing. Give him a round of applause. And Mrs. Jenkins... They're here with us. So glad they're with us. Randy and Kelly Johnson with First Bible, part of the home team, right? The Sturtzes, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And then again, part of the home team, we have Rick and Beth Haney with the John C. Haney Foundation. That's great. The Housers will be with us starting on the weekend and uh, Morgan's Meals with the Clemens family. So we're looking forward to having uh, some other folks join us before too long. If you're able to stand, would you join me? And standing, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you for those that are watching or listening online. If this is your first time tuning in. I want to encourage you to visit us and let us know that you're there at columbiaroad.org slash hello. We'd love to reach out and send you a little bit of information, find out how we can better be a help to you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for the word that we heard last night, for the presentation of what's going on in your work around our country and around this world. We thank you for the message that was heard with the young people, and we ask that you do it again tonight, that you'd be in our midst, that you'd open our understanding, that you'd challenge us from your word, that we would have an encounter uh, with you by your spirit. I pray that you'd enable our preacher tonight as he brings forth the word. May it be done with power. Uh, may you give him utterance, I pray. I pray for those of us that are listening that we'd have hearts ready to receive and we might say yes to whatever it is you call us to do. I pray for uh, those that are serving in the nursery tonight. We thank you so much for their faithfulness. That bless those that are watching by means of technology. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We're going to sing Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Jim. Our home is grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount thou poured, there where the blood of the Lamb was filled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sins. Pray. 
and now we're going to sing Send the Light. Let's sing all the verses. Send the Light. <clears throat> Well, the theme for this conference this year is reach. And if you look up on the screen, you can see reach your family, reach your neighbor, reach your coworker, reach the homeless, reach the hurting, reach the world. And there's many different places where the Lord uh, has different people serving. And not everyone can do everything, but everyone can do something. And so praise God for those that God has prepared. I'd ask Joan if she'd come at this time. She's going to give us uh, a testimony as we talk about reach the hurting. Reach the hurting. The world is full of hurting people. We face so many problems in this fallen world. It is sometimes hard to remember that God's hand is always in the glove of human circumstances. Nothing touches us that has not passed through the hands of our Heavenly Father. Absolutely nothing. But everything we endure is designed to prepare us for serving others more effectively. Absolutely everything. Reaching the hurting, how exactly do we do that? One way is to be sympathetic or empathetic for someone that is suffering or hurting. Do you know the difference between sympathy and empathy? Sympathy is when you share the feelings of another. Having had back surgery, you would be able to feel for someone about to undergo the same procedure. Empathy is when you understand the feelings of another but do not necessarily share them. You put yourself in another's shoes, so to speak. So sympathy, feeling for someone, empathy, feeling with someone, which is better. They both have a place in the Christian life, but it certainly would seem that if you could learn to be empathetic, you could help more people rather than limiting your involvement to experiences you have had yourself. You send a sympathy card to someone who lost a loved one. That could be sympathy or empathy, depending on your life. But what could you do that would be better? You could cook a meal for them or just sit and talk and listen to them. Rarely a single response like a sympathy card makes anything better. What makes something better is connection. Build connections with people. So how do we build connections with people? 
We start with regular church attendance and Sunday school. Every one of us is responsible to reach the hurting, not just the church leaders. It is the work of the church to provide soul care, as stated in Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. And each one of us make up the church, so reaching the hurting is the responsibility of every single one of us on some level. As we live out the Great Commission, no one is exempt. As each one of us matures as a Christian, the work of God in us helps us to develop empathy in caring for others. Then there are biblical counselors who are trained more intensively in caring for hurting souls. A biblical counselor seeks to carefully discover those areas in which a Christian may be disobedient to the principles and commands of scripture and to help him to learn how to lovingly submit to God's will. Biblical counseling stands on the premise that the Bible is all sufficient to help hurting people and within its covers is an answer to any problem that man faces along with instructions on how to mend broken hearts. Biblical, biblical counseling is part of the Great Commission where people work out their salvation and grow in maturity through obedience and fellowship with God. It tears down the wall between religious problems and everyday problems. Churches need to be committed and convinced that faith impacts every decision in everybody's life. Ask yourself the question, do the hurting in your church and your community think to turn to your church for help? In our post-Christian nation, counseling the hurting can be a great bridge for getting the gospel into your community. When a church gains a reputation for quality and consistent care, your neighborhood notices. The atmosphere of love is what draws many to Christ. On the contrary, if your church can't answer the questions that hurting people have, it confirms for many unbelievers that the church lacks any relevance to their lives. Biblical counseling to the lost is actually called evangelism. You must lead them to the Lord before you can counsel them. Training biblical counselors will create a heart for the lost, the lonely, and hurting, and equip a church to compassionately engage the sheep who go astray. So the work of the church is soul care, and it all must begin with doctrine. Doctrine is a soil from which wisdom grows. The wisdom that is needed to help the hurting when churches embrace the responsibility to care for their own, the whole congregation grows together in wisdom. Those who are leading and those being led see God's love and truth from a new perspective. The name of the biblical counseling program here at Columbia Road Baptist Church is Restore. I personally, I'm sure Pastor Steve would share this, would love to see our ministry grow. Right now, it is Pastor Steve and myself. There are many biblical counseling courses that can be taken in person or online from beginners all the way up to doctorates. Many of them are training centers for certification through ACBC, which is the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors. You don't have to be certified to counsel the hurting, but the more training and instruction you get, the better you will be equipped. Even if you just choose to read a few books on your own in order to better provide what we call informal counseling to your friends and family, I'm sure Pastor Steve would give you the names of some great books to help you get started. And please take advantage of the many booklets on the rack in the vestibule of our church. In this day and age that we live in, our country and the world sure seem to be in a downward spiral. While we know that it is all in God's plan, it can still be very hard. There will be more and more hurting people placing the ever-increasing onus of responsibility for those hurting on the church's shoulders, exactly where God intended it to be. Would you be willing to step up and carry some of the burden for seeking the lost, caring for the hurting, and helping others grow in Christ-likeness while using God's word to minister to others? Any questions can be answered by Pastor Steve Mosley or myself. <laughs> Thank you for pawning that off on Steve. We're, we're going to sing, uh, uh, it's a new song uh, to some of us. Uh, it's 100, we must reach them while we can. Beneath us thoughts of mirth and glee, God has said eternity in the soul.
Amen. Well, at this time, I'd like to invite Brother Rick up. I don't know. Are you having Beth come too? All right. So I'd like to invite both of you guys up as we talk about the John C. Haney Foundation. And many of you uh, in our congregation, you already know the story of John and the difference that his, his life has made, his story has made. But some of you, you're not familiar with it. And so you may learn some things. And some of us, we think we know what's going on. But I bet you a lot of us will be surprised at all of the doors that God has opened through this. So if you guys would come along at this time, that'd be great. It is 5.08, and when we first started this series, we introduced you to Rick and Beth Haney. They create safe spaces in local schools, and in honor of their son, John, who took his own life in 2017. Now in honor of Suicide Awareness Month, we're so happy to share this update with you. The couple has created more rooms since we last spoke, making real change in the fight against suicide. The latest one was just finished at Olmsted Falls Middle School. They also made $8,000 at their annual fundraiser, which translates to four more future rooms. What they want you to know while creating these spaces brings some comfort. There's still pain, but it doesn't stop their mission. What happened with our son, if we can change others' lives by what happened, that's why we're doing it. God is using John not the way we wanted him to, but the way he wanted to. God had a plan, and he knew that these kids needed this. They are so strong, and this year, the rooms take on another meeting. Olmsted Falls School counselor says that the room will help kids readjust to being back in the classroom, too. Kids will know that this is a place where they can come to um, just to relax, to provide support to one another, um, to be able to use uh, stress management techniques that they could um, put in place if they are feeling overwhelmed and, and anxious. And Dave, what's even better is that there's another room that is being completed this week at Amherst Junior High. And you know, we've talked about this so much with this series. What's so important is the conversations and that place to go because mm -hmm. you know, you don't always feel like it's appropriate maybe in the classroom in this case or at the workplace in front of everybody. So when there's that space, and we've talked about this for many months now since you started doing this series, and, and you feel like this was something that wasn't talked about enough, and now you're showcasing it, and it's good to see that people have a place to go to now to talk about this. Yeah, yeah. it's Excellent. good work being done. Amen. Before I forget, I want to point out something that happened with this uh, WKYC. That's one of the first times that they actually mentioned God in one of our interviews. We've done multiple interviews with many different um, networks, newspapers, and we, we you know, God is how we've gotten from November 12th of 2017 to where we are present day. And so we make sure that everyone knows that. But this, this interview is one of the first interviews where you heard what Beth said. And it just blessed our heart. And I just, I praise the Lord for that. So, uh, um, well, the Lord's, uh, <laughs> he gave me a totally different direction than what I had planned on doing tonight, which um, totally puts a little nervous twist on it for me. Um, I was going to start off with a bunch of uh, statistics, and um, but that's not happening, so I won't bore you with that. But um, I want to thank you all for uh, allowing us to, to share the JCH Foundation. Uh, for those of you that don't know us, I'm Rick. This is my wife, Beth. We've been members here at Columbia Road for about 36 years now, and um, this is our church home. This is our family. So... John was our son.
He walked these halls. We dedicated him to the Lord. Thank you. As I said before, we asked the Lord to use him, and the Lord is using him. He went through the nursery, Sunday school, junior church, Pathfinder, mission trips. He knew the Lord. And when this happened on November 12, 2017, I was sitting right over there. The pastor had preached a sermon on, you know, when the boat is shaking and don't worry, Jesus is there. And he's, he's been there for us. And he has led us and he has opened doors. You know, people talk about go out into your Jerusalem. That's where we're going. And the Amen. Lord is leading us. Amen. Well, I've only got a few minutes. I got a lot to cover, so I'm going to speak fast. So I hope you listen quickly. <laughs> okay. Um, John obviously was, uh, he was a happy person, full of smiles, laughter, bear hugs, big man, big football player. 5'11", 305 pounds, fox blood at 685 pounds, just a big guy, gave one big bear hug. One of those people that you want to be around, that you gravitate to, is one of those people that when you walk in a room, the room would be lit up, okay? High school was a, pa I mean, uh, football was a passion of his. He got picked to play in the Cleveland Browns East versus West All-Star game. Played college football for four years at Baldwin Wallace. Graduated from Baldwin Wallace in December of 2016, moved to Columbus. And on November 12th, 2017, about 1.30 in the afternoon, just got back from Baker Square lunch. We got a phone call. He had to take his own life. From that point on, our lives have changed. Nothing's been the same. Our family dynamics have changed, and I'll get into that in a few minutes. But, so you, you look at what we're doing now and you say, so what are you doing to reach people? Well, we reach out to those who have suffered the pain and grief of losing a loved one or a friend, suicide. We reach out to the anxious. We reach out to the depressed. We reach out to the hopeless. We reach out to all ages, children, teenager, adults. You would uh, be surprised at the number of calls we get. Now that we are part of this, uh, this ministry, which by the way is a God-given ministry and when we go and we talk to the superintendent of schools and the counselors, we make it very clear that what they're dealing with is a God-given ministry. And we'll give them one of those tracks that we have in the back in our, on our table. We make sure they get them. Um, and pr pray about that. <laughs> I, for the first time, I got a pushback on that from one of the schools because there's uh, scripture on them. And I expected that a long time ago. And uh, that's okay because uh, we're getting out there. We're getting it out there. Um, so those are who we reach. We get those calls. We help the best that we possibly can. We get them the help that they can have. We try to encourage. We're not counselors, but we are there to support them. We just recently had a suicide in one of our school systems a month ago. I about broke down because I knew the pain that that family was feeling. And I wanted to run to that house and be with them, but we couldn't. We've learned that we have to wait for them to come to us. So we also educate with mental health first aid courses. We support the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and we give out college uh, scholarships to a Fairview High School student on an annual basis. So I'm trying to do this quick. I got three points that Brother Steve said I had to make sure I covered, amen, since I'm new at this. So how to best pray for us? Well, we are not your traditional missionaries. We have got 
this is a um, nonprofit organization. We are a 501c3. Everything that we do is done by donations. So the funding, we need to pray for funding. And I'm telling you what, I could, I could talk for another 10, 15 minutes about how God has blessed us with so many people that have, have um, just come forward and given us checks and total strangers trying to help us with, uh, with our foundation. So uh, pray, pray for the funding and the donations that continue to, to come in. Um, pray for wisdom, physical strength, emotional strength. This one's very important. Mental strength. We need that. We relive this story on a regular basis. And can I tell you, it takes its toll. Only by God's grace can we do what we're doing. Amen. And I'm going to repeat that. Only by God's grace we can do this. People always say, I don't know how you're doing it. And we will tell them by God's grace. Amen. Um, pray for others that they'll see Christ in us and that we please him with all that we do. Uh, pray that we'll have that. Our brother last night mentioned boldness. Pray that we have that boldness to, to tell others about Christ. Um, Pray for a dependable truck that makes these deliveries. We're busy. And I'm not just going around the corner now. I'm taking some trips to Amherst or Cuyahoga Heights or I even got a call from Chagrin. Um, I need a dependable truck to do so. And I'm going to give you a prayer request that I had and we were praying for our storage unit. Um, that prayer, we prayed it Sunday morning in our Sunday school class and I got a storage unit Monday morning from Brother David Levine. His boss donated a 10 by 15 storage unit to us. Um, that's how quick that one was answered. So now we can go out and buy furniture and we can, we can put it in there because furniture is a real, it's another prayer request that we can get furniture. Having a really hard time uh, doing so. How can you support us? Pray, pray, and pray some more. Prayers of God's people are essential to go about his work. And that's very important. Donations, obviously. Uh, encouragement, and I'd ask you to pray for my family. Uh, my family has never been the same since we lost our son. Some people just found out recently in our Sunday school class. They haven't talked to our daughter, Katie, in over a year. Uh, Katie is disconnected from us. Katie was the one that found our son. Um, she's disconnected, trying to deal with it. In the meantime, we've lost two instead of one and four grandchildren. So please pray for us that we can um, deal with that. Pray for her, that the Lord would, uh, would mend her. And how to get involved, I'm, I'm doing my best, Steve, I really am, man. I don't, I don't know how long I've been up here. Um, how to get involved, we have a fundraiser in July, July 23rd of 2022. We'll be having our next fundraiser. We went out, we rent the um, Fairview High School football stadium from the city. Uh, we had a great time last year. Uh, we, we did really well. I, I anticipate 2022 being a fantastic year for our fundraiser. Another way you can do it is please share the JCH Foundation with others. One of the biggest things that we need to do right now is we need some corporate funding. We need to get some of these corporations that got a lot of money that just want to help people help people. And um, we're, we're putting it out there and we're just saying, Lord, you just show us who you want us to talk to, uh, work on their hearts, and, and we'll get, you know, we're going to get it one way or another, but uh, he, he, wants us to, he wants us to do the footwork, amen? So, um, you know, we just appreciate you all. We appreciate the, the, um, the encouragement, the support that you give us. I don't want to leave with this verse in Romans 12, 12. This is a verse that's on a refrigerator that I look at very often. That is rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulations, and continuing instant in prayer. Thank you all very much. And pray for these kids. Amen. <laughs>well at this time i'm gonna ask brother sturtz to come on up he's going to tell us about their ministry and his family and uh, bring us the word tonight so praise god
Pastor. Wow, what an evening already. Praise the Lord for uh, what the Lord does for us. We live in a hurting world. And I'm telling you what, uh, if we haven't seen anything in 2020, we've seen this uh, just completely opened up before us. And people dealing with so many things. And we were never meant to be on our own. Isn't it interesting when you look in the Bible that here's God, in the beginning God, he creates this world and speaks it into existence except for one thing, and that's man. And it says that the Lord God took of the dust of the ground, he formed man, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Man. But you know what he said when he looked at man? And this is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He said, it is not good for man to be alone. And what has happened in this last year is people an island unto themselves. And we have seen heartache after heartache after heartache, suicide and a variety of things. And so tonight we're going to be talking about reaching the hurting. And, uh, and I'm excited to get into the, to the sermon and I'm jumping the gun on that. So we'll get to that in a minute. But I'd like to tell you a little bit about the ministry of Baptist Couriers for Christ. And we'll have the, uh, have the guys bring the, the slideshow up. My dad started this ministry in 1979, a ministry that was born out of a necessity of a lack of the Word of God in those countries that were behind the Iron Curtain. And so... Uh, we are the Sturtz family. Wait a minute. That's not the right picture. That's my dad, my mom, and myself way back in the 1900s, 1979. We are the Sturtz family. My wife, Kelly, my son, Caleb, Claudia, Judge, and Zachariah. And the Lord has called us to the ministry that my dad started all those years ago. Uh, I was in uh, building contracting for over 20 years. I uh, had my own business for about 20 of those years. And while I was in Bible Institute, I surrendered. I was saved as a child at four and a half years old at a Knights Inn hotel, motel here in Columbus, Ohio. Beside the bed after family devotions, I realized I was a sinner and on my way to hell. And I asked Jesus, repenting of my sins, I asked him to, to be my Lord and Savior. But when I was 15 years old, I surrendered after my first missions trip with mom and dad overseas. The Holy Spirit began to work on my heart, and I surrendered to full-time missions work. I figured by the time I was 22, 23, I was going to be a pastor, an evangelist, a missionary, but the Lord had another calling on my life at that point. We were faithful in our local church, and of course, the Bible says to what? Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you've been called. And what is that vocation? Tonight, the sister said it so well. It's to be that born-again Christian, that light in our community, that encourager to brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, I feel that sometimes we can look at missionaries or at pastors and say, well, we're paying them to take our spot. No, you're all part of the body of Christ. You have a job. Each one of you have bring something to this, to this body of believers that is so needed. And so all those years of building houses and working with the youth, I was worked with the youth for many, many years, seven years as a youth pastor, but we were on a missions trip in 2017, and the book is on the table in the back, and the Lord put his finger upon my heart and my wife's heart to surrender to the ministry of Couriers for Christ. And so we counted a privilege to do that. Now, I want to our core focus of our ministry is assisting church planning through scripture distribution. Do you believe that the Bible makes a difference in people's lives? It is a static witness. Missionaries can come and go. Pastors can come and go. We can come and go. But if we can get the word of God, brother, in the hands of individuals, there's no telling what God can and will do through his word. But our ministry has got 40 years of history, so I'm going to try to break it down into a, a few snapshot moments. First of all is the period of communism. 
When dad was called to this ministry, this region of the world in the red was not open to the gospel. There was a literal iron curtain. There was a wall of concrete and barbed wire that surrounded and separated the east from the west. On the western side of that wall, Western Europe was advancing very much like the United States of America. But on the eastern side of that wall, not only was it not advancing, it was actually going into a state of decline, of disrepair, morally, financially, and spiritually. There were border crossings and armed guards. And understand, this wall was not put up to keep people out. This wall was put up to keep people in. They were prisoners in their own country. Take a look at the gold book that I have on the table back there. It was written by a lost man, cataloging his experiences growing up behind the Iron Curtain in Czechoslovakia. But there was one group of people behind that Iron Curtain that no matter how the atheistic communists persecuted, tortured, and tried to beat their freedom out of them, they could not succeed. Why is that? The Bible says, to whom the Son hath made free, he is what? Free indeed. And no matter what level of persecution was put upon them, like this pastor here, was repeatedly taken from his family, taken from his congregation, imprisoned, threatened, tortured. The last time he was in prison, he was beaten so severely that they permanently crippled his legs. He could not walk again. They returned him to his family, and they said, never ever preach that story of Jesus again. The very next Sunday, he had them carry him in. They put a chair in front of his congregation. They set him in that chair. They gave him his Bible, and he opened it, and he preached to them the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, one of the things that we find in the communist countries was that God's word was precious. How many Bibles do we have at home? I have a study Bible after study Bible. I have a chronological Bible. I have older Bible that is starting to come apart. We take it for granted. But those people could not come across a Bible hardly at all under those Iron Curtain days, those communist-controlled days. And Dad was in a uh, congregation of about 100 people in the underground church in 1978 on a survey trip. Two people besides him had Bibles the pastor and one older lady that sat in the middle of the congregation, every time that the pastor, while he was preaching, read a passage, she would open her Bible to that passage and she would hold it above her head. And people all around her would stare longingly at God's word, many of them with tears in their eyes, praying, hoping, wishing that someday they could hold in their hands a copy of God's word. These are handwritten portions of God's word. They would take a Bible, if they could get one in a church or in a congregation, and they would take it apart into sections um, according to books, and they would pass it around to people within the church, and they would write, handwrite, their own copy of God's word. And it was to that that the Lord called my dad to spend the remainder of his life getting the word of God into the people's hands who didn't and don't have them. So these are slides you would have never seen in the 1980s. These are pictures of one of our Bible smugglers. I told the kids last night we used code names, and there's one of the vehicles, kids, that we actually used to smuggle the Bibles. It had hidden compartments. The Bible smugglers were good for about 18 months to two years. Nobody went repeatedly into the communist countries, and therefore their passports would get, pla would get flagged, and they couldn't go in again. Uh, other times, it would be their, um, the stress level would be so high that after a while they couldn't stand it. Understand, in 1989, 1990, those of you in this congregation old enough to remember Ronald Reagan standing up and saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. The wall came down, but not because of Ronald Reagan. Because the Lord God Almighty was moving in the affairs of mankind to open that part of the world up to his, the light of his precious gospel. But let me tell you this. There are countries, as we see with, with uh, First Bible International, there are countries all over this world that are every bit as closed as what those countries were. And those people are longing for scriptures just like those folks were behind the Iron Curtain. But this is the next period, the period of the containers. 
Um, I'm there in the center of the picture in the tan shirt, and I'll never forget the first time as a teenager I got to stand behind a container load of scripture that was going to be freely taken into that Iron Curtain region, that former communist country region. By God's grace, the Lord, has, the Lord has allowed us to ship over 100 container loads of Scripture into that region of the world since 1990. We've got two containers on their way. One just left yesterday. The other one's been in the water for about two months now. One headed to India, and the one that just left yesterday headed to Croatia. Between those two containers, there is over 45,000 portions of God's Word. Over, over uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 36,000 whole Bibles and 18,000 New Testaments. You pray that that makes it safely to its destination in the hands of folks who need them. Then this brings the third period, the period of campaigns. So all through the last decade of the 90s, we were able to take container loads of scripture. The Lord was raising up American missionaries to go into those countries, Romania and Poland and uh, the Baltic states, Lithuania and Estonia, so on and so forth. And so as we learned about these missionaries, we supplied them with Bibles, with New Testaments, with discipleship material, gospel tracts, hymn books, things that they needed. And dad would often reach out to the different missionaries and he would say, what else can we get you? And some of them would respond with a quavering voice and a tear in their eye saying, we need help. Europe is a tough field. Stoic people steeped in orthodoxy, steeped in Catholicism. And the Lord laid on dad's heart the desire to take scripture distribution campaigns where we would assist them in their church planning. So what is the goals of these campaigns? Well, first and foremost, it's a mass distribution of God's word. It's a seed sowing campaign. You guys aren't unfamiliar, as I understand, from Brother Dale Money and Brother Chad Robinson and some of the others. You aren't unfamiliar with the seed line BPS ministry, Assembling John Romans. And if you look on the table back there, look at the ones that we have. I just got a few that are for the European countries. It's possible you guys may have assembled some of those over the years. But that's what we are physically handing out. And we're also giving out invitations with those John Romans to invite people to a presentation of the gospel, which is our second point. And that's at the end of the two-week period. And at that meeting, we're inviting folks to come, and if they attend, they get their own free copy of God's Word presented by us. We also desire connectivity with believers from across the United States with foreign field missionaries, native pastors, and their church members. I'm telling you, if you get an opportunity to go on a mission trip, whether it's with couriers or somewhere else, the Lord opens the door. He lays it upon your heart to go. Go. It will affect you. You won't come back the same. And last on our list, but first and foremost, our desire is to see souls saved, Bible studies started, churches started and strengthened, and ultimately believers discipled to continue the work of Christ. So how does that happen? How does that look? Well, first of all, it takes production. Those of you that have assembled John Romans, you're familiar with these pictures. I uh, was the youth pastor in our church for seven years, and one of the things I was in charge of was our Teen Mania Youth Rally. And we did it once a year. And uh, we would, often as an activity, we would do scripture assembly. In 2019, which is when these pictures were taken, we assembled 50,000 John Romans in 23 hours for Kiev, Ukraine. Brother Dan Gill about had a heart failure going through that process. But God was good and allowed us to do it. Scripture assembly, your fingerprints will travel to the other side of the world. As a matter of fact, to emblazon that on the hearts of the kids, we made up these stickers for the boxes. In the middle, they say teen mania, but they're a fingerprint. And we had uh, the different teams and put it together. And here was the boxes and the teens and the leaders that worked on the assembly. And we said... We're going to show you through this how your fingerprints are going to travel around the world. So next it takes shipping. You can see one of those Teen Mania stickers right there on one of the boxes. But Couriers has been actively involved in shipping through the years. The fingerprints from Teen Mania 2019 have now traveled to Kiev. Here's myself and one of our other Couriers representatives, Jeremy. And we are getting ready to, to, to hand out those uh, copies of God's Word. 
It takes availability. It takes people willing to sacrifice their time to go on these trips. Here was our Kiev campaign team. 11 states from the United States, and you can see the age of the folks. Some are in the teenagers all the way up to, well, a few years older. It takes coordination. That's where Couriers comes in. Making sure, I, we want to make sure that people that go on the missions trips feel like they have been used to the best of their ability. One of the great compliments we've received after a Couriers campaign is, we felt like our time here was well spent. And that happens by putting people at the most critical places where they can get out the most scripture in the least amount of time. Then it just plain takes physical work. Here's Miss Kelly. Notice that backpack she's got on. That probably weighs 40, 50 pounds with John Roman's invitations. She's inviting this man to come. Who He spoke some English, inviting him to come to the evangelistic service. Here's my son and I, uh, Caleb, getting ready to stuff mailboxes. Over there, that's not illegal. And you know what, Pastor? We never met a mailbox that rejected us yet. So it was great to be able to work alongside my son from Ohio to Wisconsin to Kiev, Ukraine, and ultimately into the hands of the people. Anytime that I would see people like this sitting there after giving them John Romans, going, on a, going walking around an area, giving, handing them out to other people, and come back and see them intently reading God's word, I would always, I always take a moment to pray and say, God, do a work in their heart that only your word can do. Sacrificial giving of time and resources by many folks such as yourself have made it possible to place John and Romans in the hands of these precious souls on the streets of Kiev. In a car, walking upon their way, it takes somebody to see that there's a hurting world and be willing to reach out. I always conclude this slide. You know what? Satan would love you to believe he would love me to believe that there's no such thing as good ground. There's no good ground in your neighbor. There's no good ground in that receptionist at the store. There's no good ground in uh, giving to foreign missions because, after all, they don't really want to hear it. You're wasting your time. That's what Satan would like us to believe. But I'm telling you, there is good ground right here in North Olmstead. There is good ground in Cleveland. There's good ground in Ohio. There's good ground across the United States. And there's good ground on the other side of the world. We're not responsible for the ground. We're responsible to what? Sow the seed. And, and God promises from his word that some is going to fall on good ground. Two weeks of scripture distribution and invitations has led to the evangelistic service at a neutral location where the gospel is clearly preached and an invitation to receive Christ as Savior is extended. We give out visitor's cards at the entrance, and those are later turned in by the individuals. You can see them here handing them to our team members behind the Bible table. They receive their own free Bible and then a written invite to a follow-up Bible study the very next week. These ladies here holding, for the first time ever, their own copy of a complete Bible of God's Word in Kiev, Ukraine. So how beneficial is a courier's campaign? This was at our Kiev campaign, and Nadia raised her hand, came forward in the invitation. She was one of several, and she said, I need to be saved. Here, the missionary's wife, Mrs. Demopoulos, is leading Nadia to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll never forget, after she prayed and received Christ, she had a smile on her face that was just, it was awesome. And she said, I'm 26 years old, and I am a school teacher in one of our schools here in Pole. I cannot wait to tell my students what the Lord Jesus Christ did for me. Known results. I say known because we understand what each one of these missionaries is doing, what each one of you is doing as you sow the seed, we only get to see a little glimpse. I think God does that sometimes just to encourage us to stay in the fight. But these are the known results. 24 citywide campaigns in those 14 countries. 35 cities have been canvassed. Over 2.3 million of those John and Romans that you guys have helped assemble have been physically handed out by folks like yourselves in those above cities. Over 2,000 professions of salvation have been recorded at the various evangelistic services. 
27 struggling Baptist churches all across the former uh, Iron Curtain countries have been greatly strengthened and encouraged to continue fighting on, and 10 churches started as a result of the campaigns. What can we say to that? To God be the glory. We're just tools in his hand. If we allow ourselves to be used, there is no telling what God can do in and through us. But I had to add another C, Pastor. This has been a time that's been difficult for all of us. But you know what? God's not hindered by this. We see some of the obstacles, but God sees and opens opportunities if we're willing to go through with it. And so we've got the Polish Protectors Project. We're raising funds to produce 100,000 pocket-sized whole Bibles for Polish military and law enforcement at the cost of $3 apiece. The first 25,000 of these are going to print soon. And by soon, I mean in the next few weeks. We, uh, the Lord put us together with an individual that can get those issued to the military and law enforcement in Poland. He just needs whatever we can provide for numbers. So the first 25,000 are going in, and we're raising funds for the second printing. Another uh, outreach that's happened during COVID, the German Blitz, a container load of nearly 380,000 German John Romans. These were put together by BPS Seedline Churches has arrived safely in Germany and is set for distribution throughout 2022. Funds have been raised, and for 6,000 German whole Bibles, those signatures are on the shelf at BPS Milford, and they're awaiting their covers sometime in the next uh, month or so, and those will be shipped overseas early next year. The Southeast Asia Project. Couriers is returning to its roots. Can't say the country but we're assisting financially in a TR-based translation of the Bible for a closed country of Southeast Asia. John and Romans are complete, and the first 10,000 were smuggled in last year around Christmas and are in the hands of the people, as this slide attests. Here's some precious souls re receiving Christ. And they've been trained, baptized, and now are being discipled in a local church. Will you help us get more scriptures into the hands of these oriental people? Here's our Curious for Christ staff. Pray for us in the changes as we're looking ahead at the future. God has raised up another crew to keep things going forward. Obviously, he still has more plans for the Curious for Christ ministry. So what can you do? You guys know. Pray. We're desiring your prayer support. It's been said tonight. Give. We're certainly, as a family, looking for our personal uh, monthly support. But there is Bible projects going on constantly. If you wanted to give towards a specific project, you give me a call, reach out, say, what do you have going on now, Brother Sturtz? And I'll fill you in. The money could be used in a number of different places. Or go. You can join us on the ground in a foreign country for a couple of weeks to pass out scriptures, encourage the missionary, meet other like-minded Christians, and take a physical part in worldwide missions. Come join us. This is our next campaign by God's grace. Next year, the Vistula River campaign, dual city outreach, Gdansk and Torin, Poland. If you want more information, I've got applications for the trip, and you can talk to me later. So we must all continue on. You guys got to continue reaching souls here in North Olmsted, Cleveland area, Ohio. And we're going to continue to work with scripture production, scripture and assisting missionaries, the shipping, personal distribution, and we want to continue reaching into Europe and beyond. These are some countries that I've desired to reach into, begging the Lord to open the door for that purpose. Will you partner with us to take the gospel to the regions beyond? Thank you. So let's get into God's word. Luke chapter 10. I want to preach to you briefly tonight a message that God's given me called the difference makers. The difference makers. It says... In Luke chapter 10, in verse number 30, And Jesus answering and said, a certain, man went, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him. 
And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. I have one question for you tonight. Can you make a difference? Can you make a difference? Jude, verse 22 says, And if some have compassion, making a difference. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just pray as we look into your word, God, that you'd hide me behind the cross. That you'd have me to speak only those words, God, that would be an encouragement and admonishment to these folks here. I just pray, dear God, that you would challenge each one of us through your word this evening to reach out to the hurting around us. Lord, you had compassion again and again on the multitudes. You had compassion on each one of us. You saved our souls. You redeemed us, Lord. And then you said, go and do likewise. And I pray, God, that we would take a lesson and learn a lesson tonight from this passage. In Jesus' name, amen. What was the prerequisite of making a difference in Jude, verse 22? You have to have compassion. You have to have compassion. And I love this story because when we look into this story, we see the compassion that compelled this unlikely man to make a difference in someone's life. He reached out. We've got on the banner, reach the hurting. Reach the hurting. I feel like just this sermon is punctuating what's been said tonight. So what does it take to reach someone, to reach the hurting? Well, let's look in verse 33. My first point is, in order to reach someone, you need to see. You need to see. What does it say in verse number 33? But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him. When he saw him. We need to see that there's a need around us. And unfortunately, we live in a society where everybody's walking around, including myself sometimes. How many times have we almost run over somebody or run into a pole or run into a post because we were looking down at our phone? And I think that that exemplifies the society that we live in today. People are so self-absorbed, including myself, that we don't take the time to look and see the need of those around us. And the Samaritan saw the need. There's a need for folks to be saved. They're all around us. And one thing that COVID has shown us again and again is that people are, are, are empty and they're fearful, and they don't understand. And the more that they watch the news, boy, I used to enjoy watching the news before COVID, at least parts of it. There was at least some good news. It got to the point where I couldn't even stand to have it on because every story tied back to COVID and every story that was COVID-related was depressing because there was no hope. And that's what's been pumped into our society for 18 months this is not the time for us as Bible-believing, born-again Christians to shut our mouths and put a bushel over our light. We need to see the need and share the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 4, 35, Say not ye there are yet four months, and then cometh, cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, what's the next phrase? Lift up your eyes and look. Jesus was challenging us, challenging the disciples, and it remains an imperative to us today to see the need. See the need. Let's make it practical for a minute. Do you really see your neighbor as someone who needs Jesus? Or are they just someone to argue with about property lines? Or someone with whom to discuss the weather? It's funny, you, there's places in the world, like Hawaii, they don't talk about the weather much. It doesn't change. Here in the Midwest, boy, we can, it's one of the funniest things to see somebody wearing shorts and a big heavy hoodie sweatshirt and a vest. But that's pretty typical for the Midwest. We can talk about the weather, but do we see them as somebody who needs the Lord Jesus Christ? 
Do you see that there is a place of service right here at Columbia Road Baptist Church that you could fill? And in so doing, souls will be saved and lives changed for the glory of God. Do you see that there are others within this church that are going through difficulties right now and they need you to be like that good Samaritan and see their need and come to them and help them? You know what a sad thing from this story is? That both the priest and the Levite saw the need. So can I say it's not just good enough for us to see the need? That's the first step. The second point is, in order to reach someone, you need to realize the gravity of the situation. In verse 30, what did the Samaritan realize about this man? There's an interesting two words there that just captured my attention when I was studying this verse. In verse 30, it says that this man was left, what are those two words? Half dead. Can I say for a minute that there is, once again, a world of half dead people? There is an obsession right now, which I do not understand, Pastor, but there is an obsession with zombies. Zombie apocalypse, you hear it all the time. But can I say, what's a, what, do we, what does the world classify that as? Dead people walking. People think that they are alive, but if they've never received the Lord Jesus Christ, they are half dead. You guys know on this Thursday night crowd what the Bible says so clearly when sin first entered the picture in the human race. What happened? In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. How come Adam and Eve did not fall over dead the very moment that they ate? Because they didn't physically die that day. They began to die. But their spirit, their soul, that God consciousness, that connection was broken. And they needed to be what? Born again. We have got a society, a world of people that are half dead. They are walking dead. They think they're alive because their physical heart is beating and their physical lungs are pumping air. But in reality, they are dead. And they need somebody to reach out and point them to the one that can what? Quicken them. Make them what? Alive. So in order to reach somebody, you've got to realize the gravity of the situation. Can I make it practical? What about your coworkers? What about that lost family member that you haven't reached out to with the gospel yet? Do you see them as half dead? Or are we like the priest and the Levite, kind of walking around on the other side? That could get messy if I went out and reached out to them. Eh, somebody else will. What if the Lord's depending on you to be that somebody? Number three. It's not good enough to just see the need. It's not good enough to just understand the gravity of the situation. My third point, point is in order to reach someone, you need to be in the place where the need is. What does it say in verse 34? I find three interesting words. It opens with the word and. What are the next three words? Went to him. What is the difference between the Levite and the priest and the Good Samaritan? They both saw, they both understood the gravity of the situation, but this man, the Good Samaritan, went to him. Went to him. We could take time to look at Acts chapter 16, where there was a vision that appeared to Paul in the night, and there stood a man of Macedonia, and he prayed him, and what did he say? Come! over into Macedonia, and what? Help us. Did Paul stay where he was? No. He went to him. He followed the Lord's leading. Who is the Lord impressing upon your heart to go to? And I mean unsaved or saved. Is there somebody here that you know? you got to understand, you've got an awesome pastor. You have got some great men of God here in the church, Brother Steve and the others that I've got the privilege of meeting. But there may be somebody within this church that the Lord has prepared you uniquely to empathize with, that you hear of a hurt in their, in their life, 
you can go to them and you can make a difference that even the pastors couldn't. You say, what? I'm serious. I'm sure neither one would be offended if you were the one that God used to encourage, to help, to reach a hurting member of Columbia Road Baptist and encourage them to the point where not only do they not end up out in the weeds, but they get to the place where God can use them and their story to encourage others. But how are you going to do that? You have to go to them. You have to go to the place where the need is. Do you know, what's kill, one of the things killing this country is complacency. If it doesn't directly affect me, then it's no big deal. Complacency is, in my opinion, the direct opposite of empathy. Complacency says, hey, I'm going to take a step back. Let's not be complacent Christians. Let's go to where the need is. And lastly, and I'm done. In order to reach somebody, you must be willing to sacrifice something. Do you notice in this passage in verse 35, what do we see? The Samaritan went out and he said, okay, okay, everybody, I'm setting up a roadside stand. I'm collecting help for what I need here. And I'm saying we can pool together. And the needs have been asked for. Needs are, are being met by God's people. But how does that happen? Each one of us has to be willing to sacrifice something. And what do we see? The Samaritan was willing to sacrifice what he had. He poured in his oil. He set the man on his beast. He took him to the hotel. He paid for a room for him. And when he left, he take out two pence and he said, take care of the man. And when I come back, whatever else I owe you, I'll settle up with you then. It cost him something. Are we prepared for ministry to cost us something. If we're going to reach out to the hurting, it's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us our time. It's going to cost us our talent. It's going to cost us something. Maybe financial. I don't know. God knows. But it's been said that ministry that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. So can I recap? Compassion answers these four questions asked tonight with a resounding yes. Number one, do you see the need? Yes. Number two, do you understand the gravity of the situation? Yes. Number three, are you willing to get close enough to the need to make a difference? Compassion says yes. And finally, are you prepared for it to cost you something? Yes. While waiting in a cemetery, and I thought of this, ending this sermon with this, based on what I heard tonight ahead of me, while waiting in a cemetery to conduct a funeral service, Pastor Simeon walked among the graves looking at the epitaphs. He found one that arrested him. When from the dust of death I rise to claim my mansion in the skies, even then shall, be, shall this be all my plea. Jesus hath lived and died for me. He was so impressed with that gospel message that he looked for someone in the cemetery with whom he might share it. Suddenly he noticed a young woman who seemed very distressed, hurting, and he called her over to read the epitaph. After speaking with her for a few moments, he took her address and then went and visited her the next day. The home was a scene of poverty and squalor. The woman's old mother was lying and dying of a severe illness. The two little children, very dirty, were trying to warm themselves by a small fire. Simeon prayed with the family. One by one, through the upcoming weeks, led them to the Lord after visiting them time and time again. Eventually, he found financial and physical assistance for them. Sometime later, the young woman told Simeon that she had been in the cemetery five hours that day that he had met her and was contemplating suicide when he called her to read that epitaph. Because of his compassion, she trusted Christ, her family trusted Christ, and her whole life situation was changed. Can we answer the question, can you make a difference? Yes. Dearly Father God, I thank you, Lord, for this time in your word. I just pray that each one of us, Lord, would have a heart of compassion to make a difference in the hurting world around us. God, give us a spirit like yours to not just see people as a number, but to see people, Lord, that bear your image 
Lord, as lost souls that are dying and going to hell, or brothers and sisters in Christ that may be hurting, and you've commanded us in your word to bear one another's burdens. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for all that you'll do. In Jesus' name, we love you, Lord. Amen. Pastor. Amen. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, as we have our time of invitation where we invite you to act on what it is that the Lord has spoken to you about, I want you to consider who is it that came to your mind when people were talking about the hurting. I'm almost positive that somebody came to your mind. It's sometime throughout the presentations tonight, whether when Joan spoke or when the Haney spoke or when Brother Sturt spoke, somebody came to your mind that was a hurting person. Somebody who's been crushed down by the hardships of life. Someone who's deeply sought numbness and drugs and alcohol. Someone who's perhaps even tried or has contemplated taking their own life. You could be that person, like that man in the cemetery. You could be the person to point them to the Lord Jesus and to see them and their entire family's lives change. Not just their lives change, but their eternities change. That could be you. You say, could it be me? God's great enough. He most certainly is. Take that person before the Lord right now. Take that person's name before the Lord and say, Lord, help this person. And then say, Lord, show me how I can help them. If you're here tonight and you don't know Christ as your Savior, that would be the greatest thing that you could ever do. The hurt that you feel, the disappointment with this world that you feel, the things that are just never enough, that never satisfy, the loneliness that you feel no matter who you're around. All of these things are there because you were designed to live in relationship with God, and you're not because your sin has separated you from Him. The Lord Jesus came and died and was buried and rose from the grave so that you might have the forgiveness of that sin and that relationship healed and reconciled. Come tonight and trust the Lord. Maybe you want to, in a moment as we stand and sing, you want to come forward and make this altar here a, a place of prayer and bring that person's name up before the Lord, begging that God would prepare their heart to receive help and that he might give you the words and the deeds to do to both share and show the gospel to them. Father, thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for seeing the burdens and for those that will go forth and do something about it. Let us be those people to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we sing. In 161, softly and tenderly. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. together. 
Father, we take these names before You and we, we ask that You would give help. We ask that You would bring us across their paths and give us favor with them that we might speak the life-giving truth of Your Word. And Lord, if we can't make it to them or they won't listen to us, send someone else across their path to whom they will listen. I pray that You would get them to look up. I pray that You get in the midst of their lives and break down all of the false crutches that they lean on that they might be ready to receive You. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much. You may be seated. I so appreciate your faithfulness to God's house tonight. I want to ask you to pray, if you would, for the Sipsick family. Ed Sipsick went home to be with the Lord last evening. And uh, it was a great mercy and a great answer to prayer that, that the Lord took him. And so the family, of course, Mary and, and Ruth and Lisa are the two daughters. Of course, they're grieving but it, it was uh, one of those situations where it was such a relief to hear that he was at home with the Lord. And he had a testimony of knowing Christ, and uh, the services for him will be held this Monday here at the church at 10.30 a.m. If you're able to come, there'll be uh, a viewing. Last I heard, i got to firm this up, but last I heard the viewing will be on Sunday uh, from 3 to 6 at Jenkins Funeral Home. And so if you can go and support the family, I want to encourage you to do so. And for those of you that are available to come on that Monday, it'll be here at the church at 10.30 a.m. Lift them up in prayer. Ask God to give them grace. And uh, he has so far. It's been wonderful to see how he's done that. Um, tomorrow night, we're going to be back here again, uh, asking the Lord to meet with us, asking for him to bless. And so I hope that you've made arrangements to come and be here and hear what God has to say to you. And for those that have joined us online, I hope that you will be doing the same thing if you can't be here in person with us. Remember, Saturday we have a special service project where we can actively help people that are hurting. For widows, widowers, the homeless, the homebound, the, the sick that are at home, we're putting together meals that Morgan's Meals, that ministry that ministers to them on a reg regular basis, meals that can be brought to them, and kits for especially the homeless people uh, as the weather turns, things that they absolutely will need, and we want to try and show the love of Christ. It's a wonderful thing to share the gospel, and it must be done, but we must show the gospel too if they're to believe what we say. And so let's, let's be faithful to be here, 5 o'clock. If you're going to come, we're going to have a meal. It'll be simple because it's more about serving than being served this time around. There is a sign-up sheet on the involvement board. We need to know if you're coming so that we can make sure that we have enough. There's still a few items that we need, and you can see what those items are to put together in these kits. You can see them on the involvement board. And so many things have been brought in already. We want to invite you to do so. And then on Sunday, we'll be here for our normal service times, 930 11 o'clock and 6 p.m., though you may be in a different location as you get a chance to be with some of our different missionary guests. Am I forgetting anything? All right. Praise God. Well, let's stand together. If we're able to do so, we'll close out our service in prayer. And Brother Rick, would you close us in that prayer, please? Amen. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Missionaries, if you want to try and catch some people on your way out at your tables, that would be a great blessing. Make sure you get some prayer cards.